Jesus story. And he's married to Rebecca. They have three adult children and three grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And they live in Washington. And so let's welcome Dan. We're glad to have you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, how sweet to be with you and finally get to see your home. Uh, I, I think seeing space uh, is just one of the great privileges uh, in life to be invited to someone's home and you may know, you may know them well, but you, you can never know somebody until you see the space that they inhabit. Uh, and uh, to see the, uh, both at least initially the <coughs> architectural presence uh, is one uh, of humility and great beauty. Um, that was the immense sense I had as I walked in of um, there's a lot of light, a lot of air, um, and a lot of room, <coughs> but well used. So that interplay of, of goodness, of beauty, of efficiency, and yet uh, a place in the middle for people to sit and talk. Um, somebody did really well when they designed this place. So um, good to be with you. And as well, thank you, Mark, for that intro. Um, that, that actually is, is a little haunting because you know, every, every life can eventually be summarized by a word or two. Um, uh, and, you know, it's usually a tombstone. Um, <laughs> um, but that's okay. It, it really is okay to have your whole labor <laughs> after 20, 40, 60 years of, of life sort of summarized by a word uh, or two. Uh, and that was a, I, I don't know if I've been introduced that way and that, that was very gracious. Uh, I'll say as well, just uh, these are just little compendium thoughts before I start. Uh, I, I wish, uh, as I look back over portions of my own leadership labors, uh, I wish uh, I had saved myself uh, probably 70 to 80 percent uh, of the suffering that I eventually went through uh, in the startup of an institution originally called Marcel Graduate School, then moving to a name change that you all have some familiarity with as to the process, uh, to the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. Uh, it, you went from one name to, uh, certainly I'm sure for some still somewhat controversial, but uh, you went from a very lengthy name to a very compelling name. Uh, we went from a confusing name to an utterly boring name. <laughs> um, so um, all to say that if we had had the wisdom uh, to have one of our first hires to have been HR, um, <laughs> much of our idiocy uh, and uh, arrogance, uh, self-righteousness, uh, and uh, illegality would have been um, <laughs> would have been discovered much, much earlier. And I'm not sure we would have had the wisdom even with that data to have postponed some of, of, of our failures. Uh, but I think we would, have we would have had far less suffering. So uh, to be invited into this lovely world uh, by HR, I, I find both, uh, both honoring and ironic. Um, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Well, um, I, I do sort of know the topic, so if that was of some concern. But the way I want to organize it uh, is to talk about leadership, and that is the reality. Um, and then I want to talk about the stage you're on. And, and if there is a, shall we say, a thematic core, you're gonna hear it organizationally in the structure of what I begin to think with you about. And that is, I, I think of leadership as drama. Um, and in that sense, uh, all the categories that you would bring from a play or a novel or a film or a movie uh, really have more than just illustrative or analogical meaning. There's a real, real, real sense in which um, we are on a stage, uh, we are characters, uh, we are in a drama with a plot and other characters. And so uh, if, you, if you think of this really just as, oh, it's a nice metaphor, bless you. Um, 
metaphors are mostly more real than most anything else. So let's just say that what I want to address is what's the reality of being on the stage of a drama in which you're a character called into leadership? So if that's the broad topic, then what I want to address first is the reality uh, that everyone in this room somewhere is a leader, of course. Uh, whether you are uh, sort of, uh, you know, structurally, hierarchically in this institution uh, considered to be a significant leader or a moderate leader or less leader, I, I, I just, I find most of that uh, relevant at one level, but for the most part irrelevant. Um, I, I am only too aware uh, that the people who will likely be sitting at God's left and right uh, probably not the sons of Boangeries, um, but also uh, who will likely, who will likely take those positions. Uh, it, everything I speak obviously comes out of my own thought, opinion, so truly take it with more than a grain. Uh, several bags of salt <laughs> will be helpful. But I doubt there will be any leader we know, past, present, or future, who sits on the right and the left throne. Um, so the question of each and every day, uh, Lewis has this stunning phrase at the end of the weight of glory, uh, that each and every day uh, you traverse, you have conversations with people that if you were to see them from the weight of glory they will one day hold, you would fall at their feet and worship or if you were to see them from the horror that they would one day be apart from God, they would be a nightmare that would keep you from ever sleeping again. And each and every day, he says, in all play, in all conversations, uh, bringing food in, providing coffee, setting up, going off to make phone calls at 1230, each and every moment of your day, you are drawing one another to one of those two ends. So our framework of leadership is radically different than what would be offered, uh, obviously, if I were in a um, structurally simple corporate world. Um, because our, our goal, uh, as will come later, uh, is not so much the efficiency, effectiveness, even the prolongation of any institution but the kingdom of God. Uh, and I can speak only of my institution, you'll have to speak of yours. Uh, the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology is not the kingdom of God. Uh, and so may it reflect more and more and more over generations, if allowed to exist, the goodness, the mercy, uh, the capacity to invert, revert, um, redefine, re-engage uh, human lives for the kingdom of God, it isn't the kingdom of God. So our, our prolongation, our existence, is not going to uh, make or break the kingdom of God. Uh, and once that's understood, then it's a deeply freeing thing to be asking the question, I'm a leader virtually everywhere I walk, irrespective of the position. Uh, years ago, I got off the ferry. Uh, we live on an island uh, in, uh, off Seattle. Uh, we take a ferry uh, into Seattle and we were getting off the ferry. And I had at that time a, probably a 19-year-old daughter. Uh, she's now uh, in her 30s, so this is a, a ways ago. Uh, and about a 15-year-old daughter, and the two of them were in a Titanic war over, didn't know then, can't remember today, um, <laughs> but it was severe. And in the midst of this, uh, we're, we're sitting in a kind of an area where we're all together, there are five of us in our family, and the two of them are just ripping at each other. Not so severely that it calls forth immediate parental engagement but severe enough that it's a constant nuisance and clearly uh, intensifying to a point where it's just about to be a meltdown. You know those moments. 
and really maybe the simplest thing you can hear is all leadership involves two possibility of failures. Getting involved, not getting involved. <laughs> and there's the conundrum. <laughs> and you'll want to ask questions about that. And I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue with my children. I have no clue in my organization. The worst thing most leaders can do is get involved. <coughs> the worst thing a leader can do is not get involved. That's the bind. You want to find a consultant. Uh, you want to find uh, a, a book, um, a, a teacher. Y you really want resolve of that. But let me remind you in Proverbs 26, four and five, it says two simple things. Confront a fool, for otherwise they will be wise in their own estimation. And the next verse says what? Don't confront a fool, <laughs> for you will be caught up in their folly. Haven't you ever read that sequence and gone, <laughs> oh, that's so helpful. <laughs> the word of God, authoritative, inerrant, mm -hmm, and really helpful. Um, <laughs> confront, don't confront. Get involved, don't get involved. And, but you know the answer. You know there's a kind of involvement that really is patronizing. A kind of involvement that really doesn't come out of care for them, two daughters. Uh, it comes out of your discomfort. It comes out of you're being shamed in the middle of a ferry by the rising voices of your children and you want to hush them. You know that if you have parents of adolescence or had. Uh, so you're not operating for them, you're operating for you. And don't think people around you don't know when you're operating for you, but it looks like it's for them. Why? Because people can read your anxiety. People can read your fear. People can read your anger. People can read your shame. Your face is readable to virtually everybody. Not saying everybody will do so, and do so clearly and honestly, and articulate well what they see. I promise you, everybody knows your mail, because you live it in front of everybody, even if you're pleasant, even if you have a lovely face that's able early in the morning to be cheerful. Uh, I, I took my breakfast in my room today just it just, I don't know, I just didn't want to walk out into the world where a three hour difference, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not 10 till 10. Uh, <laughs> and the woman who brought my breakfast was preternaturally enthusiastic about the day. And literally, <laughs> the door opens and she says, good morning! And I just looked at her and I said, huh. <laughs> she goes, you're going to have to welcome the day at some point. <laughs> I'm dressed. That's all I can say for my life at that point. I am fully dressed. Uh, and she, I, I, I bless those of you who have that form of engagement of your face at the beginning of a day, but may you be in a different department. <laughs> but you're readable. Uh, and so the, the task as we step into this uh, is, is to say on these two hands, d don't get involved with instrumental engagements where people know that the issue, as Mark said, is the issue of your heart is not present for them. On the other hand, I, I'm not sure there's anything worse. I mean, is, if that's bad enough, m nothing worse than quitting. N nothing worse than internally saying, I can't win, so I won't bother. Or this is gonna hurt, and I don't know what to do, uh, and so I'm just going to let these two girls fight it out and see who wins. You know, m m m maybe survival of the fittest isn't that bad of an idea. <laughs> um, but that's the bind of being a good parent. 
and as a parent, you're a leader. And that's the bind in your churches. Uh, it's the bind virtually of all leadership of don't confront a fool, confront a fool. Get involved, don't get involved, don't quit, but involve in a way in which, and now the phrase I hope you'll hear through many other interactions, is would you be willing to ponder where you are to play the unique role you've been called to live, not merely in this organization, but in life. So, first category, that was just, I'm, I'm honestly just waking up. <laughs> first category, so that you have a sense I have some organization, uh, is I wanna talk about the leadership reality. What's the stage you're on? Not your unique stage, but the stage of leadership. Uh, the reason I would say it's not unique to you is that uh, years ago when we wrote, uh, 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 what's the book the title? Uh, Leading with a Limb. Um, <laughs> what we did was we surveyed 1,200 leaders. Um, pretty simple survey, uh, wasn't highly complex. Uh, but enough data to be able to do an initial qualitative research. Uh, if you know anything about qualitative research, you're doing basically, in some ways, a, a literary review of this, the themes, the words, the core issues that seem to show up again and again and again. So from that, we were able to compile about 10 words, 10 concepts that began to come up again and again and again and again and again when people talked about leadership. Then what we did was we took a random sample, that 1,200 people, we took 30 people, uh, and we asked if we could interview them. Uh, and those were very extensive interviews. Um, and then we explored those 10 themes. What we did was we came down to five that seemed to show up like not just a little bit, but forever. Uh, and so let me give you the five. Uh, and this is what we found to be the course of all stages. If you're on a leadership stage, this is what you're having to deal with. Number one, crises. And let's define a crisis as a intrusion that is unexpected, that has the potential to reverse or ruin your life and work. Repeat it, I have no ability. <laughs> but the point is, it's an intrusion you don't expect. And it's dangerous. It's not a minor like, oh, whatever. This is going to take 20 minutes of my day I didn't expect. That's not a crisis. Crisis has that all hands on deck feeling. Uh, and most uh, subcategories to that were personnel issues, financial issues, um, missional issues. Uh, um, you know, those kinds of things seem to swirl in every organization. So crises are, are a crucial part of what you do. Uh, you can't plan for them. You can't have, oh, here's the hour I've set aside today uh, but the point is, these crises are an inevitable part of the work you do as a parent, uh, as a leader of Girl Scouts, of the work you do here at Crew. Okay, number one, crisis. Second, with crisis, it seems that confusion is an inevitability, meaning you have too much data. You have too little data. <laughs> But you don't know if you have too much or too little, you just have data. And in the midst of having too much, too little, here's what most people said as a sub-issue. The people who most are able to give you the data, don't give it. So when you're a leader, you should know in crisis you're not getting the data that you need. And you just can't go to the people who have the data and say, give me the data. <laughs> Why? Because they're afraid to give you the data. Um, they're afraid they're going to add burden, or be responsible, or be asked to do more, or frankly, they want you to fail. Uh, I mean, there's so many motivations, but the bottom line is, you should presume that in a crisis, there's just this superfluous amount, or absence of, the data you most need to be able to make a decision. Third, there's conflict. Crises with confusion inevitably bring conflict. And what I mean by conflict is um, crises with a lot of data that you don't know what to do with seems to surface for people the issue of power. 
So if you want a political world, be in distress. When things are in distress, uh, the structures that have sort of allowed us to be pleasant with one another, you know, hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, seem to wither away. Uh, and so uh, the more brutal, political, uh, opportunistic, uh, uh, divisive, uh, all those kinds of awful things seem to come in the midst of, again, these three words. I'm talking about your parenting, talking about your organization. So you've got crisis, you've got confusion, it, you certainly have conflict. And then fourth, what seemed to occur often and often again is the word isolation. The natural thing to do in the midst of that is just kind of hunker down, get by yourself. Maybe you're thinking, maybe you're trying to just go back to uh, the course that you've always used. So in isolation, uh, higher levels of distortion seem to occur. And certainly the final word that came up again and again and again is this word exhaustion. I just feel exhausted. I don't know how to get up in the morning. I don't know how I'm going to get through a day. Uh, when I come to my vacation, uh, I spend the first two or three days almost uh, on an edge where it's like I'm, I'm coming down from a high. Uh, and then I have a couple days that are good and then I'm depressed the last three days before I come back. Uh, and then I come back and I'm beat up by the amount that they're waiting for me to a point of why did I take a break at all? It almost becomes a mockery of a break becomes a way to set up even more exhaustion in the long run. So those are the five that your peers uh, say again and again and again. Let me go through those five again. Uh, with crisis and, and that kind of, of struggle, what, what, what we heard from leaders is that their response was more often than not to become self-independent and self-righteous. And I don't mean self-righteous in the typical sense of I'm better than you, but self-righteous from the vantage point of I have nobody else I can depend upon. Uh, there's nobody else I can trust, nobody else that I can look to for help in this. So it's on me. Uh, if you wonder why, and I believe this to be the case, uh, that one of the great problems in every organization is that the higher you grow to become, the more probable, I'm not saying certain, I really want to be heard well here. The higher up you get in an organization, the more probability that there is narcissism involved. And I'm not going to spend much time talking about narcissism among major leaders other than to say uh, it, it's a phenomena politically, religiously, uh, in almost all organizations. Uh, and so th that's just a question that uh, when I'm invited in uh, to, well, any organization uh, at the level of just talking, uh, I just want to say, uh, I, I struggle with my own narcissism. I struggle with my own self-independence, my own self-righteousness. This is, this is not like, oh, those narcissists. This is not a word to blame or, or a word to cheapen. It, it's simply to say some of the ways we view leadership in our country, uh, that the kind of people who rise to those powerful positions have been sent there in some measure by us who want them to be narcissists. So it's not their fault and therefore we blame. Uh, it's something we've got to be able to acknowledge that that kind of self-independent self-righteousness and the amount of hurt that often was in a person's life before they got into leadership, the kind of history that brought them into those powerful positions to begin with have a whole lot to do how they manage shame and fear and anxiety, how they deal with anger and impulse control, uh, and what we want, what we perceive to be good leaders. I mean, I'm not gonna bore you with studies that leaders tend to look a particular way. I mean, these are studies that have been done, you know, and sometimes they make uh, the Harvard Business Review, uh, but other times they're in psych magazines and psych uh, journals. Uh, as to the configuration of your face, as to why you would vote for this person versus this person. Uh, 
crazy. Uh, and yet, it, it's part of the milieu of what we expect out of our leaders. Second category, confusion. What I see it moving toward it is uh, it, the hunger for consultants. Uh, go to the pro. Go to somebody who knows more than you. And again, uh, I already started us by saying, if we had only done that, if we'd only humbled ourselves and gone to people who know worlds that we didn't know, oh my gosh, the levels of harm we would have avoided for ourselves and others would have been unbelievable. So I'm not talking about not going to people to get best practices, not getting better understanding of how to run things. You're not reinventing the wheel on most occasions. You're readapting wheels that have been created again and again and again and again. But I'm talking about that energy of getting a book because you don't know what to do with your children. Going to a therapist because you just don't know what to do with your world. Now again, I, I, I'm all for books. Oh. <laughs> and I'm a therapist and I train therapists, so there's no implicit critique here other than what it tends to lead to is confusion is a context to develop dogmatism. Your world is right and it is the right way to do it and we are going to do it this way. This is the way we've always done it, and this is the way we are going to keep doing it. And, and that is no way to deal with confusion. Uh, it resolves it momentarily, uh, but it is not an honorable way to engage. Third, the issue of conflict. Um, we create cultures of us and them. And boy, oh boy, that's true racially, it's true ethnically, uh, it, it's true in terms of how we develop a culture. Um, it's easier to keep cohesion as long as you have an articulate enemy. And many, 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 many times the enemy is more important than what we have actually developed as a cohesive core. I'm not saying we don't have enemies, uh, particularly powers and principalities. But m please hear the next sentence. Even that can be used to escape having to deal with the fragmentation and the politicalization and the misuse of power in any department or any organization. Fourth, isolation uh, ends up becoming a, a, a form of paranoia. And even if it's just a high level of suspiciousness, a kind of standoffishness that says, I don't know if I can trust you. You don't look like me, smell like me. Uh, you don't sound like me. You don't use the right words. Now, most of us are not that conscious of having those kinds of critical categories to separate and get there there. And finally, exhaustion. Uh, all I can tell you is that the byproduct of exhaustion for most leaders is, and I, I'm not going to take this far, I just want you to have this category. Y you can't be a leader unless you have the capacity to deal with a lot of anxiety. Uh, a, a lot of stress is another way to put it. Uh, and your body produces uh, uh, one, but actually many, biochemicals. The one I'll speak about real quickly is cortisol. Uh, and so every time you're in stress, any time you're in stress, your body produces cortisol. It also produces norepinephrine, uh, adrenaline, noradrenaline, uh, but for the sake of simplicity, uh, it produces cortisol. And cortisol gives you a rush. Uh, it's the same feeling when you stand uh, on the edge of a black slope uh, at Keystone and you haven't skied for a year or two, uh, and you're looking down going, whoa, I can't do this. But for whatever reason, you're dumb enough <laughs> to point those little pointy ends downhill, and all of a sudden, you can feel that, oh, and you survive the first 100 yards, not elegantly, but at this point, beauty is not the issue, it's survivability. <laughs> Uh, uh, and you know what's pumping? Yes, cortisol. We are addicts in this room. Uh, I would say, if, if you're not, bless you for your remarkable maturity. I love drama. <laughs> 
And if you don't create it, I will. <laughs> I ride a bicycle to work. Uh, it's lovely. Uh, two of my friends have been hit by cars in the last five years. Um, one's ruined, just ruined, absolutely ruined. His whole life is ruined. Um, is that a wise choice to ride a bicycle? Probably not, but uh, we're all doing dangerous things. Uh, and some of you uh, call things that I look at and go, really? Choosing that yarn is dangerous, but it's exciting to you to go into a yarn store uh, and pick a different contoured thread than another. All, all I'm saying is trust, you need danger. God made you for danger. Your body was built for danger. But danger can become, over many seasons, incredibly addictive to have this adrenaline, noradrenaline, norepinephrine rush of cortisol. And then what happens is, like any addictive process, you have the drama, it comes, the intensity, and then of course you plummet. So how do you spend post-work <laughs> days? Most of you uh, are either finding ways to keep it up, or you allow it to plummet and you fall into watching TV. Uh, uh, or you eat. Uh, you eat a lot in the evenings. How, ever thought about how that happens? Really? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you have this huge meal at dinner, and then you sort of fall into sort of the pit for the rest of the evening. How's that happen? First of all, uh, the most obvious point is you need a large meal in the morning or at lunch, not the evening. Uh, even your eating in the evenings is a way to lower cortisol. Uh, it makes no sense for Americans to eat large meals in the evening. But that's a whole, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> all I want you to be aware of, we're all addicts in this room. We're all addicted to adrenaline and the rush of cortisol. You wouldn't be a leader unless you didn't enjoy, d uh, more positively put. There's something in you that loves drama. I, I want you to bless it, but be aware of it. So if those five are happening for all of us in almost all our situations, then the only thing else I want to say is about your stage, is you need to know your stage. So in that sense, y you need conversations individually and corporately about your culture. And very few people ever do that. Uh, in other words, very few people do a kind of looped discussion. Culture is one of those realities of it's a milieu you virtually swim in. It's your world. You don't need to think about it. Uh, and yet you do need to think about it because you cannot alter what you have not reflected on. So what are the clothes that are not so much required to be worn, but it's assumed you will wear. And maybe you do have a dress code, but even within that dress code, there are certain kinds of things leaders wear and don't wear. That's an effort to define culture, but you can go further than that. Uh, what is your stage like? It, it's different than my stage. Uh, I'm a leader in the context of an evangelical seminary, uh, and in that context, we happen to be in Seattle. Uh, I would say two-thirds of our staff uh, have very overt piercings uh, or tattoos. Because uh, if you lived in our world, that's part of the culture. It's part of a way of joining, even without even consciously doing so. Uh, how many facial tattoos do I see in this room? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> You're a culture. Um, do, what's your culture like? Um, things like, how do you get a good name in this culture? What are the rites of passage in your culture? How, how does conflict get addressed or not addressed in your culture? What are the icons that have meaning and value 
in your culture? What can you mark your cubicle with? What, what, if I walked through and looked at 20 cubicles or areas or offices, what, what, what art is on the wall? Um, what sayings might you have on your desk? Th that's how you mark a culture. Just in the same way, if I come into your home, I'm looking for what this culture is like, what, what furniture you buy, how you configure it, what you put on the walls, what are the mementos? Uh, me memento comes from the word memory. Uh, and that notion of memory is, what is it that you as an organization keep remembering? Who are the heroes of your organization? What's your origin story? Well, you, you, I mean, you know that. Uh, and so, how, how's the origin story being retold, but also retold in a new way? Do you think a story is ever merely repeated? Uh, all I know is, even as an outsider, Crew as an organization uh, in 2012 is not the organization I knew uh, in 1985. Duh. Um, is that just a natural evolution? There is no such thing as a natural evolution. <laughs> it's always in the midst of conflict. It's always in the midst of n nothing moves thoughtfully and slowly and progressively. Uh, so what are those demarcating moments in your culture that have brought about significant change for you personally or your organization, your part of the organization? All I'm saying is you need to know this organization has crises and it has confusion and it has conflict and it has isolation and it has exhaustion. So can that be named? Um, and if it can't be named, how is it named? How's it hinted at? That's an effort to define your culture. You personally have crises in your life, <laughs> in your work, and you have confusion, and you have conflict. You know there's politicalization. You know there's people in this room you trust, and people in this room you wouldn't trust further than you could spit. Um, so how do you live in that midst? Uh, do you ignore those people? Do you just walk by them? Is it a matter of, eh, well, you just can't be friends with everybody? Uh, how do you work? How do you actually think? That becomes part of the task of every organization, every person, to be asking that question. What stage am I on? Second category, 10.45 is the right time to stop. Second category is, is I want to talk about the drama. Uh, if you know the stage and you know the reality of what that stage calls forth, then I think it's imperative that you, that we um, ponder what, what do you do on the stage? What does it mean for you to be a leader? Uh, and obviously I'm, I'm imposing, as any teacher does, a way of thinking. And is this way of thinking the only way of thinking? Of course not. It's one of multiple ways of thinking uh, about the complexity uh, of our work and our world. But if you have a Bible, uh, I want this to be a leading text. Is it the only text to talk about leadership? Of course not. It just happens to be a text I don't see many people talking about. And so I'm drawn to talk about it. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and this is just going to take a while. If you have a Bible, uh, again, if you don't, you have a phone. Anybody get the new phone this morning? Anybody stand in line at 2 in the morning? <laughs> Anybody get, at, 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 like in your hand, you have the new iPhone 5? It's not your culture. It's not your... <laughs> I, 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 I have to occasionally tell my students, I'm just not as dumb as I look. So <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to confess it, I, I, uh, um, but you did stand in line, you have it in your, your possession, I, I really, uh, I, I just like to hold one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm going to start with verse 5. The purpose of my instruction. I mean, Paul's just sort of starting off with one of those, you know, here's my thesis. 
This is what everything, everything I'm going to be talking about comes out of this one sentence. Purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on that. It's just, uh, you know, there's much to be said. I think you could take apart each of those categories, think about what it means for leadership, but that's not my point. It's, it's a lovely verse. I want to go to the but. But. Next verse. But. Some people. <laughs> I just love that phrase. <laughs> but some people <laughs> have missed the whole point. They've turned away from these things, spend their time in meaningless discussions. Don't you feel that at times? You listen to the water cooler conversations about the most recent game, uh, or this particular controversy, or this, or that. It's like people just blather. I, I blather, you blather, we all blather. So much of our words are just the misuse of air. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, but it's more than that. It's, it's more than just we, we don't have good conversations. What's he saying? They want to be known as teachers. They've turned away from things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they're talking about, even though they speak so confidently. Come on, you don't have people that come to mind in that? <laughs> if you want a simple phrase, biblical know-it-alls. Um, they have a system. Uh, they have a way of looking at the world which they would entirely argue is biblical. Um, and is it possible, just possible, that that's whom Paul is speaking about? People in their confidence have no questions, no real core, core questions of, is, is what I'm saying helpful? Is it true? Is it possible? Uh, and, and, and yet they misuse the law of Moses. Now, maybe he's talking about Judaizers, maybe he's talking about the party of the circumcision. I'm not saying that there aren't other factors to be thought about, but I at least want you to remember, letters were not read. The Bible did not come into what we call the canon for some 400 years. Our faith for 400 years was primarily oral, meaning you heard letters written in what we would call some form of church or congregation. So Paul, I believe, is setting his listeners up. Um, he's told them what he's writing for after a pretty traditional greeting, told them what he's wanting to accomplish, and he immediately goes for a group of people. And whether he knows that there are several people like that in this church or all churches, he's basically creating an us, us them. So the very thing I said to you, I don't think it's helpful, he's doing. But those people, those know-it-alls who are so confident in every understanding they have, and Paul's, um, at least if they're in that room, um, you know what we do, don't we? We're always thinking like, oh yeah, I know that person like that. Or maybe there's some level of honesty to go, gosh, I'm pretty confident about my view of evolution. I'm really confident about my view of homosexuality. I'm really confident about this, 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 this. In fact, there's not a lot of confusion I have in my life at all. I'm confused what to do with you. <laughs> um, I, I'm just wondering if, if Paul uh, is interacting. Now, Paul makes a shift in the next verse. We know that the law is good when used correctly. We, but those people, but those people. Now, don't you think Paul's playing with you a little? You don't think communications play? Now, if you think that there's a cynical use of that word game or play here, then I'd remind you uh, of the latter years of Wittgenstein's life. Play is what we're all doing. Games, every, every, every institution, every culture has rules. It's a game. We have ways of doing things. It's not so much right or wrong, but these are the lines you play in for singles. And these are the lines you play in for doubles. They're conventions. It's not built in some fabric of, of the existence of the universe that, no, these are the only lines you can play in when you play tennis. So 
m having a building like this. N not every Christian organization needs to have a building like this. And, and I don't mean by size or place. I, I mean, this building reflects something uh, of the institutional values, mission, passions, persons. That's good. So Paul's playing, and as he comes to this, we know that the law is good when used correctly, for the law was not intended for people who do what is right. Can you hear the likely, if you know your church, I know my church, there's already a movement of, yeah, we're not know-it-alls, but let's get to the real point here. There are people who need the law. Absolutely, they need the law. And it is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. If that is not a mouthful, baby. <laughs> There's no list like that in all his compendiums of sinners. Uh, it is the only place where he uses the term mother and father killers, which in a familial culture uh, would have been probably, n I mean, it, it, if in our unique culture, homosexuality is considered a very severe sin, it would not have been seen that way in that culture, not in that same way. But mother or father killers? Literally, inconceivable that somebody would do harm to your mother or father. Nowhere else in scripture does the term slave trader get used. All I want you to hear is, ain't no worse. This is the darkest list of sin. Romans 1, other places where he has these uh, compendiums, but nothing quite like this. So do you see the us, them? Uh, we're not know-it-alls who don't get the point. And we're certainly not like these degrading, debased, wicked men and women who who are we? We're, I don't, I don't know what the next word is, we're the people of God. We're his beloved. We're not like this, we're not like this. We, we together. But what I want you to hear is the whole premise of what is leadership? Paul's about to lead. He's leading. He, by doing what he's doing, he's leading. He's articulated what's really happening in people's lives in a way in which, in some ways, like any good leader, has to be a speaker. I don't care if it's never public speaking. When you're between two daughters in the middle of a war, you've got to learn how to talk. And every leader has to be a writer. Uh, and that is, e even if it's an email. You have to craft words. You have to become a student of language. You've got to love words if you're going to lead. And you don't just zip off an email. You just don't have an interaction where you sort of share your mind with your daughter. You have to ponder. You have to pray, suffer. You've got to learn how to edit, write, edit, write, edit. You've got to learn how to submit what you write to others to hear back from them what they think of your writing. We don't do this in isolation. So Paul's leading, and I'm getting to a point. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He's now starting to talk about himself. Do you see the shift? Talked about them, and them, and we. He's now talking about me. I thank Jesus who's given me strength to do this work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. He's in one sense talking about his authorization. He's basically saying, let me remind you who I am. Not that you need to know that, but let me just sort of remind you. Uh, I always find in one sense, you know, uh, Mark's introduction was a very sweet one. Uh, and again, not to critique him, it, it's very appropriate. Uh, but I was kind of hoping he didn't then go to the second part. 
Um, the first part was really lovely. The second part, you know, and he has a degree from here, and he did this, and he was there. And you go, all that proves is my capacity uh, for inordinate boredom. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm credentialed. Next time I introduce you, I'll get rid of it. Yeah, you just go, uh, you know, he, he's, not, he's not well. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but he truly has stumbled at least a lot of decades somewhat forward. Uh, uh, and uh, I, from the little I know, there is some love of Jesus. Uh, here he is. Uh, that's a nice introduction. Um, uh, so w when you have authorization statements of a leader, it, I, I don't think Paul's so much boasting here or like, but w what he's really doing is something you need to hear. This is how leaders function. <coughs> the, the ability to own your power is really important. Um, a team uh, that I'm part of uh, will be going uh, to Addis Ababa in a few weeks. Um, what we're doing is beginning to conduct uh, some research uh, among caregivers, uh, indigenous caregivers who deal with trafficked women. Uh, prostituted men and women, um, basically, what do they do to be of help to people with abuse and trauma? Um, and uh, that's that, you know, I do a lot of things, but that's really what I do. Um, my, my work, when I think about what my calling is, it, it's just not to talk about leadership. I like it. I like, I like days like this. But that's not, this is not what I'm about. Um, what I'm about uh, is sexual trauma. Um, what I'm about is shame and violence. So that's why I'm going to Ethiopia. Uh, and yet the question of uh, a Western approach <laughs> to even therapy, a Western approach to abuse and trauma, African, but n not even African, Ethiopian. Y you just don't make that translation. You just don't take our materials and go into that world and go, see, this is helpful. Um, so our, our task is to go listen to what that world actually already does to deal and address uh, the demands of trauma. So our, our task with one another, our task is uh, how do we use the power we've been given? And we met probably a week ago with an ethnologist uh, who looked over the protocol we're going to use for our research and questions we're going to be asking in small groups and individually. And he was gracious beyond words. And he said, can I tell you that uh, you, you already I can tell uh, there are two basic problems. You're approaching your question. Your questions are really wise if you're Western and academic, which is fairly true to what I am. <laughs> And he goes, but if you're wanting to interact with people in Ethiopia, those will not be as helpful. Very kind man. O okay. What would be more helpful? So we went through that. He goes, that's one problem. He said, there's a second problem. You go into Ethiopia, and you're very concerned not to be a colonialist. Very concerned not to force your model, force your thinking on another culture. And I'm going, thank you, yes. And he said, but you're not utilizing the power you will be given. You will be given because you're white, uh, because you're educated, uh, and because you've had a lot of involvement with many of these people in other settings. They know who you are. They've, they've touched you, felt you, heard you before. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Then they are going to give you an authority y you don't seem to want to use. And I'm going, but power is almost always misused. I don't want to, I, I, I'm going to talk about abuse and trauma. I, I, I don't want to abuse and traumatize. <laughs> and his response was, I've heard you before and you've already said, you cannot not hurt. You, you cannot not harm. But you seem to be open enough to address it when it happens, sometimes. And the answer is, sometimes. And he said, use your power. Use your power. What is the power God gave you? 
Some of you in this room literally are geniuses. Uh, and you don't like to hear that. Uh, you have IQs 140, 150, 160. Uh, and, 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 and nobody knows that. Uh, maybe very few know that. Not that you should be going around, uh, uh, shall we say, on your cubicle. Uh, <laughs> but, but you won't tell the truth about your power. Um, you won't admit because you defer it to Jesus. Um, uh, and it looks humble, perhaps in some organizations or in the Christian world. Uh, but it's just a refusal to own who you are. So one of the questions we'll come back to, especially after we get a little bit further, uh, is who are you on the stage? What is the character you have been called to play in this drama? I'm still saying, what's the drama? How, how do we live this drama? Uh, and at least, uh, I think I'm getting somewhat closer. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence I persecuted his people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. How, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that comes from Christ Jesus. Now, Paul takes a breath. If you look at your own translations, uh, this is indented. Uh, remind you there are no verses or punctuation uh, or indentations in Greek. Uh, so it's your translator saying to you, here's a whole new thought. Um, uh, Paul has a phrase. This is a trustworthy statement. And I like the NLT's translation of it better than the NIV, which I'm using obviously the NIV. The NLT says this, this is a trustworthy statement. Worthy of your full acceptance. Pa Paul's literally taking a kind of, I want you to hear this. Make, if, if, if you've allowed the patter of my language to sort of just inure you into sort of like, yeah, I've heard this language before. There's nothing really particularly new here. Yeah, 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 there are, there are know-it-alls and there are people who uh, really need the law because they're just really wicked. And yeah, we know who you are, Paul. Uh, we know you're a servant of Christ. We, we even know a little of your history. We know you're a persecutor of the church. Uh, but you, we know you were converted. You know, in other words, Paul's authorizing, owning his authorization, his authority. He's telling a little bit of a story, and, but they already know that, more than likely. But then he goes, pause. This is a trustworthy statement. Like, uh, Paul, you know when you have a conversation with somebody and they say this phrase, I, I, can I tell you the truth? Isn't that a warning? <laughs> what are they saying to you when they say that? You're allowed to talk. What are they saying? Brace yourself. Brace yourself. Sort of what God said to Job. Brace yourself like a man. <laughs> yep, uh, you're not going to like that. You're not. This is probably not going to be one of the most enjoyable moments. What I do as somebody who's m more shaped and formed uh, with Christopher Gaston Best in Show is, m m what comes to my brain is this. What, you haven't been telling me the truth before? So you're just basically confessing you're a liar. <laughs> that is my way of distancing from the boom that's about to drop. Um, but let me tell you the truth. That's what Paul's really saying. Uh, I have a trustworthy statement. Like the others weren't trustworthy, Paul? No, they were. But I want you to note this. And then that phrase, worthy of your full acceptance. Meaning, uh, I'm aware the next sentence is not going to be something you come to and pass by quickly. You'll hear it. You won't really let yourself likely accept it. But I'm asking, before I tell you this, that you hear it as true and you open your arms to this. Now you know where I'm going. I mean, you know the passage. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and then different translations, of whom I am the worst. I am the chief of sinners. Now, what I want you to hear is, this is leadership. 
Leadership isn't about getting a department to be more efficient, though it includes that. Uh, leadership is not about um, making sure that our public image uh, is as it should be given what we know and claim to be true about what we have planned for as our inner values. It includes that, blah, blah, blah. This is what leadership, this is what the gospel is about. Therefore, what Christian leadership is about. Here are the next phrase. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as, and the phrase, at least in the NIV, is as a prime example. If you sort of explore that word, you've got some Greek skills, what you'll begin to see is it's a more liturgical term. It's a, it's a term of theater. It, it's not just I'm an example on a flannel board. It's, it's I'm meant to be a model. Model, I'm meant to be a role. I'm meant to be, this is, this is how I'm meant to live in the world. I am meant to be a picture of the inversion of the gospel. So here is your apostle who already has put himself in the position of being, I'm not one of those, I'm not one of those who is a know-it-all. And I'm not one of those who's a mother, father, killer. I'm not one of those who's a homosexual. I'm not one of those who, 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 who. I'm not of those worlds. I'm your apostle who is worse than everyone I just named. Who, if you line me up against the worst, I, I take ascendancy over all other sinners in the world, past, present, future. Hyperbole? I, I don't know what you do with this passage. He's making a point. It's certainly not true. But it's a helpful point that we all need to remember, that we all struggle. Uh, n n take his words seriously. This is a trustworthy statement, worthy of your full acceptance. The man we follow who has shaped our understanding of life is saying nobody on the earth struggles more with sin than he does. And yet he is an example of the grace of God. So I have three categories uh, that I'll introduce, we'll come back to after a 15 minute break. I believe all leadership, all lives, are meant to reveal minimally the story of God. Your story is meant to reveal the story of God. That's as simple as I know how to say it. Uh, your story uh, is relatively unimportant. Who you are is not that important in, in, in the scope of most people's lives. To your family, yes. Uh, to a few friends, yes. But in that sense, to say that you have an epic life requires another worldview. <laughs> and here's the worldview. Your life reveals Christ's death. Your life reveals Christ's resurrection. Your life reveals Christ's ascension. Do you know how? Do you know how it does? And do you know how to bring your death to his death, your resurrection to his resurrection, your ascension to his ascension. We speak story. That's what leadership is. It's a drama of story. Institutional story, department story, individual stories, stories upon stories, complex interplay of stories. What's your story? So as simply as I can, can put it, if you don't know your death, how do you expect to make known his? If you don't know your resurrection, how do you expect to make known his? If you don't know what it means to be ascended to the right hand of the Father, then how do you make known his ascension? Uh, I'm not saying any of this is easy, and I certainly don't imply that by the time we depart at 1230, it will be clear to you. All I'm asking is, isn't it important? Even if I don't do much to be of help to you, isn't that important? I've got to think through, how does my life reveal Jesus? 
That's as simple as what leadership is. My life is meant to reveal Jesus on the drama stage of being, at least for nine years, the president of a young organization. Now I'm the founding president, and I'm a professor, and I have all sorts of power still, influence still. Don't have the title that I once had, but I still have a leadership role. How do I play that role with a new president? But who's the new president? What's his story? What's my story? How do our stories intersect? And how do our stories intersection actually make known the story of God? What's the story of God? It isn't just this, but boy, it is this. Death, resurrection, ascension. So quickly put, because I only have one minute and 30 seconds. You know death through every loss, every heartbreak, every moment of shame, past, present, and future, where you have had division in your heart, your body, where you have known dis-ease, where you have known life other than Eden. That is where you have known death. And are those stories available? Not that they're to be told in the context of your next staff meeting, but the question is, are they available to the people in your world? Do you see them as important, or is there still too much heartache, too much shame? Those stories can't be told, they can't be used, they're not really part of you. So your past abuse, your past sexual trauma, uh, where you've used people, where you've hurt people, not just where you've been harmed, but where you've harmed is death. Are those stories available? Not that they're to be told. Wantonly, often, regularly, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, are they available? Second, where do you know celebration? Where do you know joy? Where do you know delight? Where does your life go, yes? And for most of us, um, the things that bring us yes, as I interact with the Christian community, oftentimes don't seem to be the things that are deemed most spiritual. So for me, one of the places I would say yes would be a fly that has gone 15, 20 feet in front of me on a mm, slow moving Montana River and watching a really stupid cutthroat because that's the kind of fish I catch. <laughs> Suicidal, <laughs> demented, stupid fish. Watching it rise, <laughs> come down on my fly and go down and to set the hook and to be transported into another realm. <laughs> the question is, what for you are tastes? And notice the word taste. What for you are tastes of the resurrection? What gives you taste and see that the Lord is good? Your ability to have things in your life, like knitting. I, I, I don't understand how that could be a taste of the resurrection. <laughs> to me, it, it would be the relentless tedium of Sisyphus pushing the rock up the mountain. Uh, but, but for you, if knitting is one of those moments of joy, then I need to have enough curiosity to be able to go, talk to me. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, really, I'm really ignorant in terms of how you find resurrection here. But that's what we're meant to be involved in with people's lives. We must be able to join their suffering with ours because it's the only means by which we open the door to the death of Christ. And we must be able to join other people's delight, even if it's in watching a reality TV show. Honey boo boo. <laughs> uh, if I've eaten some of the things I've eaten in parts of the world, then you can watch Honey Boo Boo with a neighbor and find something of resurrection in all delight. So do you see now what we're to do? What's leadership? Weep with those who weep. 
and rejoice with those who rejoice. How is your weeping today? And that's not a metaphorical question. Uh, it would be what I would want to ask every leader in this room if given the privilege of a longer conversation. W what in the last 24 hours have brought tears to you? 48, 72, week, the last week. Uh, and if I begin to hear things like, um, y you mean that literally? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, w w what brings tears? I don't cry. Oh. Okay. Um, forgive me for what sounds like crudity. I know for many of you it will. Well, h have you had a bowel movement? <laughs> this week? Uh, excuse me. What? Of course. Then why isn't the same? Why is your soul constipated? Why have you not watched the news? Why have you not interacted with friends? Why do you not grieve of where your son or daughter is? How do you pray with people whose hearts are so broken and you don't know what to do? Are you telling me you don't weep? How did you, how did you get to that spot? in your own narrative, your own story, your own drama, that you have become a desert and there are so few tears in your own life. Let me take you, I haven't been but twice, but let me take you to the streets of Addis Ababa. And you don't weep. I don't know where you are as a human being, but the question is, where do you laugh? Where, where do you just cover your face and just Roll. You don't laugh like that. Then I have a problem with you, because you're not alive. You have somehow learned to function, but you do not have the depths and heights of death and resurrection. Then no wonder people see an anesthetized Christ in your life. I haven't even come to the final category. How we use our lives is where we bring the ascension of Christ to play. So take a break. We'll be back.